Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders, everyone. Yay. <laughs> we have a great team tonight. I am Dr. Justin Burke, joined tonight by Dr. Chris the Chu Manchu and our wonderful producer, Dr. Cleo Rochat. Say hi, Cleo. Hello. Cleo, it is so exciting to see you. You've recently uh, moved to, to start intern year. How's everything going? It's going well. I'm learning tons <laughs> and tons, and there's so much more to learn. <laughs> Uh, well, we're extremely excited that you were able to produce this episode and did a phenomenal job. And because Cleo was out saving lives, unfortunately is not able to join us on the audio uh, interview, um, but did do a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure this yes. is set up. Um, and so thank you, Cleo, for, for all your all your efforts. Thank you so much. That was a blast. Was great. Our guest tonight is Dr. Craig Rohan, who's here to discuss atopic dermatitis. But before we talk about that, Chris, remind us about the show. Yes, we are the Pediatric Medicine Podcast. We interview leading experts in the fields to bring you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. We have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. Craig Rohan. Craig Rohan is a dermatologist and pediatrician at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, where he also holds a faculty appointment in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Prior to joining Wright State, he completed a 24-year career and retired from the United States Air Force. He trained at the University of Colorado for his medical degree, then University of California Davis for his pediatric residency, then University of Southern California for his dermatology residency. During the last few years of active duty, he was able to collaborate with Wright State and now sees patients, teaches residents and medical students and conducts clinical research, mostly in inflammatory dermatology. He teaches us about the pathophysiology of eczema, how to counsel patients about non-pharmacological treatments, and why we should not be afraid to, of topical calcineurin inhibitors. He was a great guest, and I learned a ton. In an effort to be completely transparent for CME purposes, we're going to start listing financial disclosures, and Dr. Rohan had no personal financial conflicts of interest. His department does receive grant funding from Relitzar and Eli Lilly for clinical trials. So without further ado... I am itching for you guys to hear this one. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> uh, Dr. Rohan, thank you so much for spending time with us to, to teach us. Thanks for coming on to the show. We're so excited to have you. Welcome to the Crib Ciders. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Cool to be part of this. Well, we're, we're grateful for, for you to be on, and we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. And we typically start with kind of some rapid fire get to know you questions. Uh, the first one is, can you describe yourself to, to our listeners and give us kind of a one-liner of, uh, of who you are as a person, maybe outside of medicine? Yeah, well, I'm a father of two, a husband, I uh, work uh, at a uh, medical school that's fortunately adjacent to a bike path. And uh, so I, I bike to work about 100 times a year, get a, maybe 3,000 miles in, and, and uh, that's something that uh, I suppose my colleagues and and uh, coworkers all uh, all find a little bit quirky about me, but a uh, big part of my day to day happiness is that bike ride. So it's good. That seems like an unfathomable number of miles. I I can't even I don't know if that's a lot, but it sounds like a, a surmountable number of miles. Yeah, it depends. I mean, it's it's about seventeen miles each way, uh, which is what you want. You don't want a short commute because you're going to be sweaty. You're going to need to take a shower anyway. So you want something that actually gives you a break from your day and uh, a little bit of a workout. So yeah, I don't know if it's insurmountable, nice. but it's good. Now, some people may not know this, but Craig and I used to work at the same institution. And he was the first person I knew who, in the middle of the night, drug in a treadmill to put underneath his desk. And he bought this treadmill like secondhand. And he was the only one I knew who had a treadmill desk at work. And do you know how many miles on the treadmill you, you put in over the over the time you had it? Yeah, no, I still have it. And it's at the next institution. And then uh, I have one at home. Uh, admittedly, I don't use it at home as much. 
Uh, but yeah, no, I stopped counting when I got to like four or 5,000 miles. And that's actually a pretty big life hack for any physician. If you have some charting at the end of the day, if you have emails to answer, if you have PowerPoint training of some kind that you have to click through, it's actually a lot more tolerable if you're walking three, four miles an hour. So again, I actually don't use the treadmill desk as much when I bike. So I'll use it. I, I won't even use it for months on end. And then the winter, uh, I use it quite a bit again. So yeah, big fan. That's great. That's like before it was a trendy millennial thing, which yeah. I feel like now it's starting to. Yeah, I got it in 2014. And again, I bought another one. And unfortunately, they've really gone up in price. They're mm-hmm. uh, pretty popular. And a treadmill desk, if you really want to use it, you need a one that's more of a uh, the maximum speed is like four miles an hour. And it can be on for like eight hours a day. So your treadmill that you have in your basement for running actually doesn't work real well. They burn out you know, in a matter of months. So you have to buy kind of one of these fancy ones if you want to make it work. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, that, that's good that that's, uh, that's Chris's enduring memory of me. But uh, uh, yeah, no, it's good. That that and your endlessly amazing, like on the spot Durham lectures that you would give to the residents, you know, basically the chief would be like, we had someone cancel. Craig, can you do a lecture? And you're like, oh yeah, I have like one of 50 lectures I can just do and you just pull one out and you do it. So yeah, no, I enjoy like, uh, you know, one of the aspects of dermatology that's great is it is visual diagnosis. So you can have someone who has very marginal interest in dermatology. Maybe they're, you know, they're going to go into, I don't know, let's say uh, developmental pediatrics, which uh, has, you know, you know, you look for some ash leaf macules or whatever, but there's not a lot of derm and, uh, or, or pick your medical specialty without a lot of skin involvement. And yet when you flash up a lecture with cool skin pictures, the residents uh, tend to get pretty interested. And, and it was actually probably a little bit of a um, badge of honor that a lot of times attendings would come to those lectures too. So um, I still really enjoy lecturing when I can. In fact, that's one of the things that coming out of COVID in-person lectures has been great to get that going again. So uh, I'm excited to, to kind of dive into some content because we have a lot of great questions for you. And uh, we're talking about a topic that's extremely common in primary care and an inpatient that really does have a lot of uh, you know advanced science behind it, I think. And so I'm excited to have an expert such as yourself kind of break it down. Our wonderful producer, Cleo Roach, that's not able to join us quite yet. So I will do the honor of saying the first case. And our patient, Emma Oliant, is a 10-month-old who was a previously healthy girl and presented to her pediatrician's office with a chief complaint of new onset redness and dryness on her cheeks and scalps for about two weeks. Her dad states that she's overall been very well, but the rash appears to be getting worse, and it seems to be really causing a lot of discomfort and itching. On physical exam, she's very well appearing, but there are areas of erythematous patches with scaling on her cheeks and on an area of her scalp. His, her skin is also noted to be dry. So in kind of framing this discussion, which is clearly on atopic dermatitis, can you talk to us first just a little bit about when do we first start seeing a topic dermatitis? When does it typically present? And, and are there kids that are at higher risk for developing a atopic dermatitis? When do we really start looking for this um, in pediatrics? Sure. So there are a number of different phenotypes. It's uncommon to have truly a newborn with uh, eczematous dermatitis. And, and if so, you really should consider mimickers such as seborrheic dermatitis or rarely primary immunodeficiencies, which can actually have uh, eczematous dermatitides as an early presentation. Uh, again, that's uncommon. And occasionally you do see a, a very young, several week old baby who's already developing what goes on to declare itself as true atopic dermatitis. Otherwise, you get a, a little bump between about two to six months. Actually, I shouldn't say a little bump. You get a lot of babies. Uh, showing up with eczematous dermatitis at two to six months. Again, some of those babies will have been babies who had severe seborrheic dermatitis, and you can think of that as sort of their first of many triggers they may have been sensitive to. And then, of course, you can see other kiddos who are developing sensitivities to breast milk or to uh, traditional cow's milk formulas with similar presentations of eczema. Then you get another little bump within toddler years, and then most of the kiddos who are going to declare with infantile uh, atopic dermatitis will usually do within the first couple years of life. And there's a relative drop then of new incidents. And then when you make your way into kind of uh, middle school, high school, teen years, 
you'll get a new group. And in fact, that new group is often a pretty challenging group of kiddos with atopic dermatitis and actually tend to be more lifelong patients than many of the babies, many of whom will outgrow it. Um, although, again, there's also going to be a small phenotype, uh, a small group of, of kiddos with a severe atopic phenotype that's going to last for uh, years or decades as well. With all these different types of phenotypes, like what, what exactly is the definition of, of eczema or atopic dermatitis? Yeah. Actually, and, and, why are and there that, two names for it too? Actually, I never understood this either. Sure. Well, eczema generally means uh, abnormal skin in, in, the very, in the crudest nature. It's, it's essentially a, a synonym for dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis is essentially the combination of skin findings and natural history that has, well, and there are major cri diagnostic criteria for actual atopic uh, dermatitis. So there are major and minor diagnostic criteria, just like so many things in medicine. And the major diagnostic criteria are pretty straightforward. It's unfortunately using the definition in the word, uh, or the word in the definition, I should say. So uh, the, one of the first, the first of the three major diagnostic criteria is that it should have a, an expected classical eczematous presentation, meaning it if you think it's eczema, it should look like eczema. Amazing. Uh, the second is that it should be pruritic. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, as part of that first qualifier of being eczematous, is it should be bilateral. It should be symmetric and bilateral. Uh, and then the second is that it should be uh, pruritic. And then finally, it actually, uh, one of the major diagnostic criteria is a family history. And the most common, you know, mutation, not that we do genetic testing on most kiddos with eczema, is uh, prophylaxis, although there are many other polymorphisms and contrib contributory genes separate from prophylaxis. And so, uh, essentially, what that means is if you do not have a classic waxing and waning, eczematous, symmetric, itchy eruption, um, there should probably be a family history with it as well. So, uh, if if you don't have the family history, it really should have you know the the classic features. There are then a number of what we call Hannafin criteria that are uh, the minor diagnostic criteria for eczema. And some of them are interesting and, in fact, are useful to teach a parent who might be skeptical about something being eczema. So hyperlinear palms, that even little infants will have extra creases on their hands, and sometimes parents will. They hadn't realized it. You show them your hands. You show them the medical student or the resident's hands who are who is rotating in clinic, and then you show, and then they realize, wow, that, that is different. Um, there are actually some ocular findings that are, are more academic than anything. And then some things that people just assume. So for instance, intolerance to wool is one of the minor diagnostic criteria for atopic dermatitis. A uh, tendency toward exuberant bug bite responses is a uh, minor diagnostic criteria. And things like uh, intolerance of having perfume sprayed on you or going to a theater and the person two rows back has strong cologne or perfume and then having uh, finding that to be irksome and potentially even irritating your skin. So, so there end up being actual diagnostic criteria, which is important to think about. We do see mimickers not infrequently, especially in infants, uh, seborrheic dermatitis, rarely tinea, rarely contact dermatitis. And so, you know, having the correct diagnosis, is obviously uh, a preamble to going about effective treatment. And to officially diagnose eczema, are there a certain number of major and minor criteria that you need to be able yeah. to put it into the EMR? Yeah. So, well, I don't know. Gosh, are we behold <laughs> are we that beholden to the EMR? Uh, so, uh, you know, again, those criteria of being again uh, a, a classical eczematous morphology, symmetric, being pruritic. Uh, again, it typically will wax and wane, uh, and then a family history. And actually, the minor diagnostic criteria are as much for completeness sake and to help predict comorbidities. So again, you can have things like uh, anterior development of cataracts. That's, un that's rare, but actually of uh, ophthalmology practices, you know, young patients who need cataract removal, a lot of those uh, you know, young adults would have an atopic diathesis. Again, these are all uncommon, but known. Pityriasis alba, which is something that, uh, you know, pediatricians see daily. I mean, this time of year, this would be, uh, you know, pityriasis alba season. Um, that is the, the kind of light hypopigmented patches typically on the photodistributed areas of the face that actually represent relatively minor eczema. 
And so these minor diagnostic criteria help, you know, fill in some of the blanks for uh, a new family that with uh, being told that their, their baby or, or adolescent or rarely adult uh, has atopic dermatitis. But it's not like one major plus three minor. It's not uh, like yeah, endocarditis. So again, you really like to have uh, of those major criteria, you like to have, you know, most of them. Again, if, if you don't have a family history, then you like to see the rest of the again, symmetric eczematous, pruritic, waxing and waning. And that's partly because so, so many of the, especially proflagrin, a lot of the other atopic uh, genotypes are autosomal dominant. So. And are there specific areas that are most effective? And can you also talk about, are the, you mentioned the different phenotypes. I know like numular eczema is a very specific presentation. Are there other ways that uh, eczema really yeah. presents itself. Yeah. And so, you know, I think many people from med school or from uh, depending where they trained or, or the ethnicity of the patients they see, it's going to dictate actually um, what eczema looks like for them. So, you know, I'm sure if you go into like Google images and, ta and type in atopic dermatitis, you would see antecubital fossa, meaning anterior uh, elbow, um, symmetric eruptions and behind the knees, popliteal fossa, eczematous uh, plaques. And that's sort of the, if you will, Caucasian phenotype, whereas actually the Asian phenotype of eczema will look like denuded cheeks. So you'll see a little uh, Asian infant who looks like their cheeks were placed against a power sander, and then maybe the rest of their skin doesn't actually have severe eczema. And then African Americans typically have somewhat more bumpy eczema, so papular eczema, which uh, you know, can become confluent into, you know, larger, very severe plaques. So the numular eczema is, it actually can be its own thing, especially in adults. We'll have patients who never had uh, any of the, uh, you know, eruptions of, of classic eczema as infants or as teenagers, and they'll show up with these coin-like, very intensely pruritic eczematous little plaques that, again, were likened to the coins of, of you know, millennia ago, uh, numulus, uh, that's where that name comes from. And, uh, uh, and so we do see numular eczema in, in younger kids, uh, and not just in adults, but it's often its own thing or just one uh, little side manifestation of, of a greater, uh, you know, uh, atopic dermatitis spectrum. You can get eczema on your hands and feet. Uh, you can get scalp eczema. Um, but, the, but the kind of the main phenotypes, like we talked about with the symmetric, you know, kind of leathery, uh, what we, you know, what we think of as eczematous dermatitis is probably the, the major phenotype and certainly the uh, major phenotype in severe kiddos who go on to need more aggressive therapy. So. I appreciate you mentioning some of the different skin colors and tones and looking through dermatology. I know that that's something that recently the field of dermatology is trying to provide greater education on and getting a better understanding. We try to be very cognizant of health disparities, health inequities. And is this something that is very noticeable in either the field of dermatology, but also diagnosis and treatment of uh, atopic dermatitis? Yeah, yes and yes. I mean, I, I did my pediatrics training in the Bay Area, uh, and then I did my dermatology training in Los Angeles. So I, I was fortunate to be able to see a wide variety of, uh, you know, as we say, Fitzpatrick phenotypes, which are the six kind of uh, classifications of, of complexion. And absolutely, things look different between those, uh, between ethnicities. Now, in terms of disparities, for sure. Unfortunately, a lot of our most severe eczema kiddos are African American. You can, you can, I can, you know, name off uh, patients over the decades I've seen of every ethnicity, but many of our African American patients have especially severe atopic dermatitis, often within the context of a severe uh, atopic diathesis in general with severe asthma, severe food allergies, severe allergic rhinitis. And so in terms of, uh, you know, the social determinants of, of health and how it exacerbates our, our patients of, of whatever ethnicity, but especially those with um, socioeconomic constraints, getting to see a pediatric dermatologist, it can make it far more difficult. So, you know, where I practice in the Midwest, we have a diverse community. I think if someone was in my waiting room and, and just sort of tallying up as patients came in, uh, most of my African-American patients probably present with more severe 
disease, they probably had gotten a lot more uh, treatment from urgent cares or ERs, maybe with, unfortunately, a little more prednisone and systemic steroids than I would have liked for how severe they were, Uh, meaning we have better options in many cases than kind of 1950s um, or oral systemic steroids for these things. So yeah, very inherent, unfortunately. Uh, but hopefully we're hopefully we're doing a better job and hopefully the network of pediatric dermatologists around the country and pediatricians and allergists. I, I should have preambled that at the beginning of this talk that you could have invited a lot of uh, well, well qualified physicians to, to be a guest on this uh, on this episode. Allergists take great care of eczema, as do pediatricians and, uh, and dermatologists. I, I was a pediatrician for four years in practice before I did my dermatology residency. And I think I was actually pretty good at treating eczema back then. I didn't use cyclosporin, and obviously dupilumab didn't exist. I didn't use azathioprine and, and a lot of the bigger guns we use. But, but I think I did a pretty good job um, with my eczema patients, as do most of our colleagues and listeners to this. So. Now, before we start talking about more about some of the treatments, I, I still want to go back a little bit into sort of un, the underlying causes of atopic dermatitis. I think you said there was some genetic pre- preponderance, you know, looking at a f- a fla- flagrant. <laughs> I can't even say it. Um, Pro, like, pro-flagrant. 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 So what, what causes uh, atopic dermatitis is, you know, if there's some genetic predisposition, is there something that happens that the skin can't hold moisture, which is what I've heard before? Like, what, what's going on there? Yep. So we certainly know the broad strokes of it, but actually of conditions that are still challenging in 2021 for dermatologists. Severe atopic dermatitis remains, you know, one of our bigger challenges, even with new medicines, new biologics, uh, a wider array of steroid sparing options and so forth. So, again, there are several underpinning uh, genes, but most involve are involved with basically skin barrier. And so that prophylaxis gene that's talked about most, you know, most often in the setting of the genetic risks for developing atopic dermatitis is essentially a lipid that uh, helps uh, form the overall barrier of our epidermis. When uh, the prophylaxis polymorphisms uh, from mom or dad or just from one of the two lead to diminished ceramide and lipid structure of the epidermis, essentially you have a little bit more immune surveillance of the outside world than the immune system probably needs. So you start to develop far more of, you know, triggered and, and again, what we call TH2 or atopic type triggers that lead to downstream immunologic effects. And so those downstream immunologic effects certainly vary by patient and severity. It varies by just how much of your pro- prophylaxis was missing. It's a, it's a big molecule. And if you had a large uh, mutation where you have kind of just a crummy, very minimally effective gene product of prophylaxis then you're more likely to have a severe uh, phenotype and also have more of the classic atopic march with asthma and hay fever and food allergies because, again, your immune system is now seeing things that it probably shouldn't have been seeing. Uh, There are some exceptions to that. Um, One of the points that I think helps us realize we don't know as much as we think we do, especially in the past few years when we've tried to do things like prophylactic emollients, which is to say covering at-risk infants with Vaseline or other moisturizers at risk, meaning, you know, they had four older siblings who developed severe eczema. Are there things we can do to kind of replenish the barrier in the in the fifth kiddo? And it doesn't work as well as you think. And so if you look at cord blood, many babies uh, with severe eczema, they'll actually already have I- elevated IgE levels basically at birth as you clamp the cord. So again, it's, there's definitely uh, some uh, additional factors beyond, you know, what we can uh, show you on a gene sequencing of prophylaxis. So. And maybe as part of that, and looking at the triggers for atopic dermatitis, is there ever a role in allergy skin testing or IgE levels to help understand uh, a patient's atopic dermatitis? Yeah, so IgE levels or just uh, eosinophilia on a uh, peripheral smear Um, are, again, those minor diagnostic Hannafin criteria. And that actually says it pretty accurately, that it's relatively minor, meaning those levels uh, in the extremes, especially if you think you have a patient who has one of the uh, eczema mimickers of hyper-IgE Job syndrome, then that could be a valuable test. But in most cases, the IgE level is not going to be a highly effective test because it's going to be elevated 
if you thought that they had that pattern. And I, I'm sorry, I forgot the other question. So IgE or, oh, or allergy, or allergy testing. skin yeah. testing, if there's specific allergy triggers. Yeah, yeah. So it really varies by age and it varies by patients. So there definitely is a subset of incredibly severe, especially infants, who likely have a defined trigger that uh, can be tested for, identified, and uh, hopefully reduced or eliminated. That's actually a very small component, a very small fraction of, of babies with eczema. And so the yield of doing allergy skin testing for the vast majority of infants with eczema is relatively low. And they actually only have so much skin. So a little fi little small panel of, of like four or five uh, forearm intradermal skin testing can be performed. Um, but uh, we had a, uh, at my current institution, we have a uh, multidisciplinary clinic for some of our more severe patients where we have myself, potentially one of my partners, and then actually one of our pediatric allergists who together see the patients um, along with some, uh, some nurses to go over things like wet wraps and some of the kind of non-medical fingernail hygiene and uh, emollients and uh, all, the, all the various part-time job instruction that comes with taking care of a kiddo with severe eczema. And uh, the, it's a relatively small minority of kiddos who we go on to do patch tests, or excuse me, that we do uh, intradermal skin testing. Now, the side note would be, as kids get older, allergy testing might be more predictive, especially as they reach two, three, four years of age, especially again, if they start to develop other aspects of the atopic march, again, allergic rhinitis, food allergies, asthma, then the role for uh, skin testing may be higher. And then another form of skin testing, which is done by both dermatologists and allergists, which is patch testing that's used to identify type 4 delayed hypersensitivity triggers. Many kiddos, as they get older, will develop co-sensitization or comorbid contact dermatitis, where about, whereupon there are actual physical triggers, things touching their skin that can include actually medications, unfortunately, but preservatives, fragrances, all sorts of crazy stuff that can be uh, serving as an exacerbation. So as is the answer for so many of these things, it really is case by case, but uh, the uh, presence of other atopic March uh, patterns, severity, age would all be uh, some of the factors that go into the side who would benefit from uh, skin testing. And so you mentioned the term atopic March, and can you talk a little bit about that, about what the natural progression of disease is, and if we're able to reduce the risk of developing other atopic conditions later in life? Yeah, so again, the classic atopic March starts often with food allergies or eczema or both at about the same time, and then within the first few years of a, of a kiddo's life, they start to develop uh, wheezing, whether wheezing often enough to kind of buy themselves chronic therapy for asthma or allergic rhinitis, again, potentially severe enough to require uh, some of the interventions needed for allergic rhinitis up to including um, immunotherapy, although unfortunately immunotherapy often exacerbates eczema. So it gets to be uh, kind of a juggling act with many of the kiddos with very severe patterns. And again, what we call atopic march where they're developing uh, multiple comorbid, you know, TH2 type allergic conditions. In terms of what we can do to prevent it, yeah, that's still sort of probably a work in progress, especially with our emerging medicines that we have available. But uh, we try and try. We don't always accomplish it. So on a case-by-case -case basis, there are, again, going to be probably some families, some siblings who we're going to work our tail off uh, doing everything to optimize the management of each of their conditions. And yet the next time we see them for a visit, we may notice that, in fact, they now have a note from a pulmonologist or an allergist, or maybe they had an ER visit because they uh, had an, uh, an asthma exacerbation. So uh, we try. We're still working out. We don't have perfect answers on that yet. So. Fair enough. So you mentioned like that a lot of these kids, they may develop a lot of core morbid issues like other contact dermatitis, which I feel are often in my differential of things when I look at atopic dermatitis to begin with as well, because I'm just looking at skin things. Are there any other, I know we've mentioned a couple of times, especially in the neonates, are there any other mimickers or other things that we must keep on a differential when we're seeing these, these kids with what we think may be atopic dermatitis? Yeah, one of the things that my residents, uh, you know, kind of, I hope, remember is the actual lecture I give them each year on, on atopic dermatitis. The first five or six slides are pictures of eczematous eruptions. And just as an example, we go from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And then at the end of it, 
I have a picture of uh, my son when he was young, and he had a little bit of that. What I mentioned, pityriasis albus, the little white uh, spot on the cheek. And I and I tell them uh, actually the only picture that they were seeing that could be called eczema, despite seeing a whole collection of eczematous dermatitides, was my son. And in fact, then we back through all the list of the other things, and you know, seborrheic dermatitis, and uh, actually uh, seborrheic dermatitis presenting at, with a uh, with HIV, and then contact dermatitis, and then tinea. So I have a beautiful picture of this antecubital fossa that just has to be eczema. There's just no way this can't be eczema. And, uh, and in fact, um, so again, I'm not sure how useful this is, hopefully. But you can see kind of an antecubital fossa. It's red. It's irritated. Yeah. And then, you know, when I get to further in this, in my kind of favorite lecture here that I've had up, just to bring my memories, I, this was the kiddo's other elbow. And it's like pristine. And uh, so the same day picture, you know, you've got this one very eczematous elbow and then this other relatively pristine one. And so that was, you know, tinea corporis. That was, you know, essentially ringworm absolutely mimicking eczema. And again, that goes back to why the actual diagnostic criteria is is probably something to think about uh, so that uh, you don't, uh, uh, well, in that case, throw a bunch of emollient, which is sort of uh, fertilizer for tinea, or topical steroid, which is uh, absolutely fertilizer for tinea. So, and then contact dermatitis. So a very severe, often worse, lichenified. Uh, lichenified means it. Uh, you can essentially see the kiddo's fingerprints without getting a fingerprint dusting tray. So you see the skin lines, the dermatohieroglyphics. Uh, and so when you see one or two little areas that are way out of proportion to the rest, you at least have to consider contact dermatitis, uh, and which can be to you know a bazillion different things. We routinely test for like eighty different things when we do patch testing. And that unilateral skin finding that you gave as an example for tinea, how did you ultimately make that diagnosis? Because I feel like as a primary pediatrician, what I often do for all things dermatology is I put a steroid on it, and if it gets worse, I put an antifungal on it, and if it doesn't get better, I refer to dermatology. Tell me, tell me what I should be doing uh, and, and how, for a case like this, I could have better approached and not only recognize that it was asymmetrical, so maybe it wasn't eczema, but say, I think this is a atypical presentation of tinea. Yeah. So again, it's going to be case by case. You know, the snobbiest play would be to do a scraping. And that can often just be, if, if you're not used to looking at KOH or chlorazole back E, which is uh, one of our antifungal in clinic stains you can do just on scrapings with the slide. And again, that's a challenge. That's like CLIA certification, or the, that's like, you know, having a binder where you're doing uh, CLIA certification, you're probably getting tested on it by someone in your uh, clinic or hospital apparatus to prove that you know what you're doing, or you're just scraping into a sterile urine cup and you're sending it to the lab and labs in many cases, if you give them enough skin flakes, will do you a solid by performing a KOH and then they'll send a culture and if it was a rip-roaring case, a lot of times the culture will be positive within a week or before. Um, and there are some advanced diagnostic tests that can come back sooner. And actually, you can get susceptibilities on fungal cultures as well, which is actually kind of a cool thing, although it's not usually a standard thing. So again, some combination of doing some type of culture, maybe a KOH or chlorazole black E in clinic, to make the diagnosis. And then at that point, yeah, you're just using antifungals. So you're, you're skipping the steroid step. So despite uh, the classic joke of, uh, uh, and again, I was a pediatrician before I was a dermatologist. So I told the joke of, uh, you know, just put a steroid on it. Um, there are a few conditions that uh, get worse. And I, I see that daily. I see, you know, what we call uh, tinea incognito. That means you made it just confusing enough with topical steroids that it didn't uh, show obvious ringworm features. We see scabies incognito, not uncommonly. That actually could be kind of a nightmare for parents or for patients because they end up on multiple steroid courses. And, and uh, as a dermatologist, actually, you need to keep that high in your differential because you may not get a classic presentation and you may not get an obvious burrow to scrape after. But anyway, sorry, the tra the, getting a little sidetracked on that. But assuming you don't have any available access to a culture, you don't, you can't do a scraping on your own, and it's going to take six months to see a dermatologist, then you actually could hedge your bets with something, something like a topical, again, generic medicine, ketoconazole, 
which has actually a little bit of anti-inflammatory properties. It inhibits 5-lipoxygenase, and so it has a mild kind of hydrocortisone um, efficacy. And then you could, after a few weeks of doing, again, for, uh, of a topical antifungal, you could then sort of chase it or have them add a topical steroid, which would actually be a pretty good empiric approach and would really reduce the likelihood of uh, inadvertently treating um, what is actually an infectious condition with something that handcuffs the immune system's ability to uh, uh, to have fought it off on its own without you uh, meddling. So. so I want to roll us back because we started talking about these, you know, treating these crazy conditions. So say I, I'm the pediatrician, I see, I look at it and like, for sure, 100% atopic dermatitis. What are things that I'm I'm doing in terms of counseling parents on skin hydration or, or, um, or, or, you know, what, yeah. what are they supposed where to be do doing with these kids? Like, yeah, where Because I feel this is, this is the important thing, right? Because I feel if it's done wrong, then this is where they sort of flare and have more issues. But if you're doing good emollients and stuff and talk, talking to them, like, what's, what's your script? How do you talk to them about this? Yeah, so it's very case by case. And I'm sorry it's as complicated as it is. Um, I actually usually ask my staff to book, uh, you know, new eczema kiddos at the end of the morning or the end of the afternoon, because this is potentially going to be a longer visit to do a good job and to really get the family doing doing what you need to do. So uh, again, it varies significantly by age, but let's go over again, kind of that two to six month old coming in with eczema, maybe severe eczema. And so uh, you can think of it on a thing, a lot of the things you talked about, which would be like barrier. So trying to use some type of emollient that helps to somewhat replace the prophylaxis effect that wasn't there. And so in general, more hypoallergenic emollients are favored. So things that have less preservatives, uh, at least by myself, I think most, uh, most pediatric dermatologists would prefer emollients that don't have a lot of formaldehyde releasers or other preservatives that can eventually, the babies can eventually become sensitized to where the actual medicine that we were attempting to use to help at some point starts to sabotage. Uh, and, and that can happen. And that's, and that's a problem. The, uh, when we talk about barrier, a, a not insignificant factor are little infants, uh, little babies' uh, fingernails. So one of the pearls I tell parents is before they go to bed at night to basically grab their uh, little infant's uh, finger or hands and put those fingernails up against their cheek and make sure that uh, that infant's fingernails can't uh, scratch their own skin. Or as I often say, they should go to bed with butter knives on their fingers instead of steak knives. And that's not insignificant aspect of, of barrier function. When you think about uh, if you're actually going to have to treat an area of eczema, you can't necessarily just use emollients, again, moisturizers uh, everywhere. Then you want to use something, hopefully, that's the lowest potency of topical steroid that's going to get the job done. And so we have a few different options that are in the class 7, class 6, class 5. That means relatively low potency, sort of the lower the better. Uh, I would tell you that's an area of contention, though. I, there are some dermatologists who would say that if you see severe eczema, that they would be perfectly happy to let a pediatrician pull the trigger on a far higher potency, even a class three or a class two or a class one, meaning uh, ultra potent topical steroids that on a receptor affinity basis are potentially, you know, 10,000 times more potent than over the counter hydrocortisone. And then there are, again, other medications uh, that, that can be additive. So things like uh, a topical mupirocin for super infected areas that's common in eczema as the barrier function is sabotaged, that various skin flora can overgrow. And unfortunately, the skin flora begets more eczema because, uh, you know, particular staff will have a lot of super antigens. And so now you're really recruiting areas of the immune system to kind of fight off overgrowth skin flora. And that just drives the atopic dermatitis into, into overdrive to a great degree. Can I ask you a little more about, because we talked, you, when you're talking about emollients, you sort of we were very general and I know that there are some people who are very ingrained with which ones they're supposed to use. And I know there's a lot of differences between, you know, the ones that are more petroleum jelly based. And then there are ones like, um, that you guys sort of talked about that, that were similar with the, um, the ceramides, 
um, as well as like ammonium, lac like lactic acid. Like what's the difference between all these? I, I always feel like I, I don't know. There are just so many out there. And sure. in the end, for all of my patients, I just say, uh, put some petroleum, petroleum jelly. It's cheap. It seems to work really well. Um, you sort of were discussing like you were trying to avoid certain types of emollients too. Can you explain that a little more too? Yeah. So, you know, this is important enough. I'm glad you asked. I think that um, Vaseline is great, but there is sort of a pearl in getting families to use it. Uh, I usually tell them to buy more of a jar than a tube and then basically to touch two or three fingertips to the top of the jar so that they don't have a big gob of Vaseline on. So if you try to put Vaseline on like you would toothpaste um, or, or like just a big, a big uh, you know, large quantity, it's basically not going to rub into the infant's skin and the family will try it once. They'll think you're a fool and uh, never use it again. Uh, so a Vaseline type emollient, basically an ointment uh, or something uh, that, that has kind of that, again, using the word in the definition, Vaseline-y, uh, consistency is excellent, an excellent barrier, but you really have to kind of uh, have the patients put it on just like I said, fingertip at a time um, or a few fingertips at a time so that they don't put so much on that the baby's like a slippery uh, little human falling out of their hands. Of the more cream-based emollients, again, there are just a lot of them that will have uh, either methylchloroisothiolizinone, which is a, a notorious preservative that basically makes things feel a little bit more moist and elegant. So that is the preservative used in diaper wipes, and uh, and it's put into a lot of emollients because it makes you know we'll say dollar store emollient feel like more of a department store, very fancy emollient. And so the, the arms race, if you will, of some of those preservatives in the last decade has led to a lot higher rates of contact dermatitis to these uh, preservatives. Again, that diaper wipe preservative in particular is, is common enough that we see, you know, a diaper dermatitis and then we see kind of a dermatitis around the neck. And that's because the family had first wiped, uh, used the the diaper wipe while they were at a meal to clean off kind of the area in their neck. And then separately, when they changed the diaper, it used a, one of the wipes on the butt and the babies develop a type four delayed hypersensitivity response. Again, most people do fine with diaper wipes, but that percent that maybe around 1% of babies who develop it, yeah, it ends up becoming pretty severe because until it gets recognized, the family is basically applying dilute poison ivy on a wipe to their baby's neck or their baby's butt. And until we explain what's going on, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. So again, in particular, emollients that have a lot of preservatives that have a longer ingredient list are, are in my mind, less favored. And I think less favored by most of my, my colleagues. And then you had mentioned ceramides. There are a number of products that have ceramides within them. They probably are a bit more effective. Um, I don't know if they're such game changers and they're, they're really not too much more expensive. So it's reasonable to for families to try ceramide containing products. Again, my bias would be ones that still don't have a lot of uh, preservatives in them. Is there a timing that they should be doing this? I mean, so you say multiple times a day, but you know, I've always sort of, when I've given this talk to parents, you know, I think the longstanding parents, they, they used to say, um, you know, don't give our, the kids a bath because they'll dry out. And then when I was in residency, I was taught, no, actually it's the opposite because the skin can't hold moisture. You want to give them more baths, but you have to make sure you like soak and seal them. I mean, I always, always say the soak and seal, like soak them in the bath and then don't pat them dry, but then try to seal it in with the emollient. Um, is, is this, is this make sense? Am I giving them right information or is that wrong? Yes. And at this point, this podcast becomes the atopic dermatitis with Craig Rowan and with Christopher Chi, because that was said perfectly. There are some offshoots of that. Uh, so in particular, wet wraps, which uh, have probably made their way in the past couple decades as a relatively standard treatment for uh, atopic dermatitis in infants and, and toddlers. Uh, and interestingly, in the elderly, we use it too. We'll use sauna suits and things to essentially mimic wet wraps. But basically, you soak the baby in a bath, um, not so hot that they're stripping moisture off, but it can be comfortable. We're not trying to give a room water temperature, but if a uh, bath, but if there's mildew growing on the walls because of how uh, hot and humid that bath was, that's probably uh, overly stripping moisture from the baby's skin. And then when they, when they're dried off, just like you said, you tamp dry them. And then if they have severe spots, you could put some of their actual medication, some of their topical steroid or tacrolimus inhibitor, which is a generic brand of a uh, topical calcineurin inhibitor. Uh, and then you cover it with an emollient and then you basically put a wet 
cotton onesie on them, and then you cover that with a dry cotton onesie and put them to bed. And that's uh, actually a nice effective option, especially for moderate or moderately severe flares of atopic dermatitis. So, so baths are good. Getting moisture uh, and keeping the moisture in is an inherent part of us saying that baths are good, though. And how about bleach baths? What's the what's the final word on bleach baths? Yeah. Oh, I think that's settled science. Bleach baths are great. Uh, I think there's a danger that too many families will underdose the bleach. So we're trying to achieve a bleach concentration very similar to pool water. Uh, and so depending on size of baby and risk of drowning and so forth, but the simple math on it is if you are doing a full bathtub, then basically a cap full of household strength bleach is what you're after. Now, the corollary with this is families will need white towels. That's, that's not great for their uh, wedding towels that were uh, on their uh, registry that uh, or passed down from, from grandparents, uh, and now you put uh, white bleach spots on them. That, that, that's bad for them as a physician, so certainly warn them. And, uh, but yeah, it helps decrease some of the skin flora that can overgrow in uh, atopic dermatitis. And uh, there is probably some, um, and actually just by decreasing that, then you, you decrease some of that, uh, again, super antigen burden that sets off underlying uh, immune reactivity that sets off eczema. Another nice option actually is salt water baths. So instead of, uh, instead of chlorine, you can use rock salt or salt to basically simulate uh, ocean water. Less messy in terms of towels, but it's hard to not to get it all to dissolve. And so a lot of times they'll have some salt that has to be kind of scooped up at the end of a bath. Uh, but no, those are great. Uh, they're just, you know, relatively labor intensive, uh, not, not, not easy. And, you know, add to kind of the what can become a part time job for families that have severe eczema. So I love treating things. Uh, you know, that's why one of the reasons I came into medicine. And so we've talked a lot about and we've hinted at some of these topical steroids or, or some of the treatments. But can you talk us through if a patient is referred to you uh, for eczema and the primary care pediatrician, you know, tried some over the counter hydrocortisone, but then didn't really feel comfortable when they come to you, what are your kind of first go-to treatment options, and maybe even what level, you mentioned the, the potency and strength, what level of strength of topical steroid do you give me permission to, to start before, before referring to dermatology, because I clearly don't know what I'm doing? Yeah, no, that's great. And actually, this is probably a good, uh, I guess, demarcation for the um, podcast episode too, because pretty much everything we talked about, things like emollients, things like watching uh, fingernail hygiene, wet wraps, uh, bleach baths, all those things can be pretty well, um, and I guess you could say vigilance for uh, mimickers, all of those things could be generalized to pretty much every single patient with atopic dermatitis, that that's pretty much standard advice that uh, you can be comfortable with as sort of step one, two, and three. Families that are thinking about this are, you know, the kiddos are going to have at least some benefit from that. When we get into the next kind of stage of now, you know, things they're going to pick up from a pharmacy by prescription rather than things they're going to pick up from the emollient uh, section of the uh, local drugstore or of the bleach or the rock salt section, um, then you then things become a lot more case by case. So of the topical steroids have been the mainstay for decades and and they're great, although Again, it's important for a pediatrician or a dermatologist or allergist to realize that the kind of body surface area considerations of a baby and just the skin structure means that you can actually get more systemic absorption or local skin effect, including things like thinning of the skin or dispigmentation. Those things can actually happen more easily in an infant or a baby. And so using the weakest topical steroid that gets the job done is great. Again, some would say using a high potency or even ultra potent. Again, that's the class one, two, three out of the one through seven scale is warranted for severe cases to essentially break the cycle of inflammation that leads to more severe eczema, super infection, and then what we call lichenified eczema. But again, that there, there would be some debate on just how high you can go. I usually don't go too much higher than uh, class three 
uh, number of class threes that pati- that uh, that pediatricians might be familiar with or use uh, include uh, triamcinolone or mometasone or desoxymometasone. Uh, there are many other you know generic options uh, that uh, would be in that group. Is there an easy way as as a pediatrician pediatrician to like a rule of thumb, like what, yeah, I think triamcinolone, hydrocortisone, and, uh, and then I start getting lost you know, between percentages and creams versus ointments. Is, is, is there just some easy way outside of like yeah. trying to find a table sure. to like sort of know these? Yeah, I think that uh, using a few and becoming comfortable with that is probably the best route. So again, simple over-the-counter strength, hydrocortisone 1% or 2.5%, which again, I'm sorry for those uh, listeners who didn't know math would be involved, but it's two and a half times as strong as over-the-counter strength is a nice option. That's a nice option for the cheeks or the neck, and it's 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 not a not a bad uh, first line for for a kind of mild to moderate eczema. Desinide, again, another generic that's moving up to class five, is a nice uh, a nice. It's FDA approved for six week olds and up, and then moving up to class uh, again class four, class three. Uh, triamcinolone or mimetazone. They actually vary which class based on its cream or ointment. Ointment is more potent, so it actually, the same medicine in an ointment form will shift up a whole class, which uh, is a several fold increased potency when you talk about a you know, corticosteroid uh, receptor and the downstream activities uh, uh, that essentially it's a transcription and all sorts of innumerable uh, nuclear processes and downstream anti inflammatory effects that develop. Uh, and then the class one that again, I, I try, I would probably be one of the pediatricians who really tries to avoid it in those under two is called clobetazole. Again, at least some listeners will have had pediatric dermatologists that they've gotten referrals back from or have, uh, or were taught in residency when they were rotating with a dermatologist that even the highest potency clobetazole is reasonable for severely affected uh, infants. Again, I try to try to avoid that myself as my own sort of personal bias, if you will. The next class that that is, you know, pretty commonly used and actually is a, a nice steroid sparing agent uh, are the uh, topical calcineurin inhibitors. So these are a little more focused than topical steroids. They work by decreasing uh, interleukin-2 and uh, cut off a little bit of the that, that Th2 response in a little more focused manner than a, than a steroid does, which would kind of just shut down everything. And uh, so those, you know, tacrolimus and pimacrolimus, they're FDA approved for two and up, not uncommonly used off-label with decades of experience for below them. Uh, They can sting. And so a common pearl is to keep it in the refrigerator or actually to use a topical steroid for a few days first to sort of cool it off. But many patients can actually kind of maintain a remission or or keep more mild uh, eczema at bay with the topical calcineurin inhibitors which then, you know, you know, spares from having to put topical steroids on, but, but frankly speaking, means that most of their immune system isn't getting messed with when you're, when you're rubbing on the skin, that it's far more selective. There are newer um, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Chris Averly is the one on the market. And again, it's uh, maybe a little bit more useful on the face. Again, it stings probably a little bit more than the topical calcineurin in- inhibitors. But all of these last few medicines that I talked about, unfortunately, are not in the, you know, they don't get up to the potency that the more ultra potent topical steroids can do. So we're, we do reach some. There are some uh, medicines on the on the launching pad potentially that would have different mechanisms of action that could be something we can look forward to in medicine as well. We'll see. So. And when do you pull the trigger on the topical calcineurin inhibitors? When do you switch out of the topical steroid classes? And should we be ever doing that in the primary care office? Yeah. So again, there's some referral bias or specialty bias here in that uh, those are, those are uh, again, uh, decades of safety, great medicines. I think, uh, I think pediatricians should feel very at ease using those medicines uh, because they were derived from oral forms used for basically organ transplant uh, rejection prevention. So, you know, oral tacrolimus has been used for decades in the uh, organ transplant world. And the topical medicines, thus, there was a lot of, um, you know, vigilant oversight because of the concerns that these might be too immunosuppressive. And so uh, the kind of phase four or long-term longitudinal studies have been uh, probably more vigilant than most medicines. And so over the millions and millions of patient years of using these medications on babies, 
uh, and children, it hasn't shown that these are medicines we should be scared of. In fact, I'd be more concerned about, you know, hydrocortisone over the counter strength being used near the eye, you know, increasing the risk of cataracts or glaucoma or being used in thin skin areas leading to striae or increased absorption. So uh, again, no conflict of interest for these generic meds to say that these are, are things that pediatricians should be comfortable with, um, the topical calcineurin inhibitors. So, Awesome. And you say the, the topical calcium you can then use on the face then? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent option, uh, excellent place. Again, they can sting. And in fact, the thinner the skin area, the more they're going to sting. So sometimes we take some therapeutic liberty and use a few days of topical steroids first to kind of take the edge off of the uh, eczematous plaque and then sometimes treat it with both the topical calcineurin and a topical steroid at the same time and then get out of town with the topical steroid and then maintain, hopefully, a remission of that lesion with the topical calcineurin inhibitor. So going back to prescribing the actual steroids for the, for the children, say you decide on, I'm going to start, you know, I'm the pediatrician, I'm not quite sure how bad it is right now. I think I could treat it with pretty low potency, so I prescribe a 2.5% hydrocortisone. Like, how, what type of guidance am I giving them? Am I, you know, I, I've typically said, like, you spare only to the area of concern twice a day for two weeks, but no, no longer than that. Um, is, is that reasonable guidance or do you say something different? And then the second part to the question is when I prescribe, you know, usually I'm like 30 gram tube, 60 gram tube. Like how, how do you, how do you like decide that? And I heard something about fingertip units before, and I always forget how to do those measurements. So do you use those types of things when you're prescribing? Yeah, and those are two excellent, excellent questions that I hope uh, even things not involving eczema can, uh, uh, this can be useful for, for everyone, all the listeners. So the, um, the concept of tachyphylaxis is uh, probably most uh, relevant, maybe not most, there may be pediatricians of all other specialties who are, who are going to be concerned that, I'm, that it's too much of a derm thing. But I think every specialty we are concerned about that you upregulate receptors in this case for topical steroids and suddenly you have diminishing effect and in fact when it comes to the skin you still can get side effects systemic absorption stria everything we've mentioned even though you had saturated the steroid receptors and we're getting very diminishing returns and so there are all sorts of ways to minimize the risk of tachyphylaxis uh, you mentioned you know sort of two weeks on uh, one week off that's an excellent excellent way to do it Five days on, two days off is another good way to go. But the importance of, of breaks is important. So I usually will, you know, tell patients that the math gets, uh, you know, breaks the rules you learned in fourth grade, where if you use a topical steroid for maybe six weeks, twice a day, it's actually not going to work as well as if you used it for two weeks, took a one week break, used it for two more weeks, because after week three or four of your six week continuous use, you had so massively upregulated the steroid receptors that uh, you weren't really getting much benefit at all for that last week or two. On the other hand, that tachyphylaxis break between your two-week treatments, it means that when you reintroduce it in essentially the third week, you're essentially going to have like this supercharged you know, steroid effect where it's far more effective. So the guidance you gave was good. Again, you vary that a little bit based on the part of the body. So if you were uh, having to treat something near the eyes, uh, in the axilla, or in the genital area, which are three notoriously very thin-skinned areas of the body, you might do half that or even less. So for a young infant's axilla or, or penile or vaginal skin, you might do you know three or four days um, rather than even a week or two. Again, giving an ample period of time for those uh, steroid receptors to downregulate before retreating. And then in terms of quantities of medicine, absolutely, that's a uh, at least some portion of my referrals for all reasons, not necessarily just atopic dermatitis, basically are well treated when I just give the patient enough medicine. So I see them, I ask them, how did the medicine that your pediatrician who's gotten you this far in life and kept you fully vaccinated and probably kept you out of the hospital, whatever else, how, how well did the medicine that they tried work? And they're like, yeah, it was great. And then we ran out of it. Uh, and then it took two more months to see you. And, and then we just give them enough. And so the fingertip unit is actually uh, calculated for like an adult. So it's not quite, it's more of a curbsiders than a curbsiders episode. Um, <laughs> but uh, in general, 
you know, if you're using something over the body of a of a baby, you know, a 45 or 60 gram tube is going to last, you know, on the order of one to two, one to three weeks, depending on their severity. And so they we certainly have like 15 gram tubes, and that's often for like eyelid application and other things. That's that's often way too small of an amount uh, to be sending someone home with, uh, you know, widespread eczema of any of any kind. So and yeah, I routinely, especially for teens, bigger kids, I might send them home with 180 or 240 grams of something. The uh, a few of the topical steroids, the triamcinolone most notoriously comes in 450 gram one pound tubes. And that that's, you know, oftentimes overkill. And, and again, not to pick on that topical steroid, which actually is an excellent topical steroid. But interestingly, patients can develop what we would call medicament contact dermatitis, which is to say that chronically using certain classes of topical steroids over open, inflamed, barrier-compromised eczema can lead to a sensitization where they unfortunately develop contact dermatitis, again, to the medication that the well-intentioned pediatrician had prescribed. And steroids are broken into these groups, A, B, C, and D, and it turns out A is the one most people have heard of. That's prednisone, hydrocortisone, triamcinolone, and others. And that A, B, C, and D is actually the kind of allergenicity category. So it turns out the ones we use most often are probably a bit more allergenic. Again, this doesn't happen no. often. But it does, <laughs> of course. And so the the some of the concern that we see with the four hundred and fifty four gram one pound tub of triamcinolone, at least I have concern that some of those babies, and it's it's uncommon. And again, this is very much um, specialty bias because I I kind of see those cases, and and the vast majority of patients a pediatrician might see on a day to day or month to month or year to year basis. It, it's an uncommon diagnosis, but I see it not infrequently at all that in fact they became sensitized to the medicine. And now uh, they get into this vicious cycle where it's, it's really pretty interesting science. So they still are topical steroids. So when you put triamcinolone on your triamcinolone contact dermatitis, for a day or two, it'll actually treat it. Uh, but the actual anti-inflammatory effect of that triamcinolone wears off pretty quickly. But you now just set off a little type 4 uh, delayed hypersensitivity bomb because you have contact dermatitis. And so the rash comes back. And so... Again, what do you have at home? You have triamcinolone, so you keep putting it on, and you get this expanding circle of of contact dermatitis. And again, we see that often enough that a lot of times my first change is just to a non-group A topical steroid, put the triamcinolone in the back of the medicine cabinet, and, uh, and then pa sometimes patients do great. In follow-up, I'll usually do what's called a use test, which essentially means you put a little dab of triamcinolone on a Band-Aid and you stick it on part of the baby that doesn't have any rash and you watch it for a couple of days just to make sure you didn't set off, again, a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. You kind of watch the, keep the Band-Aid in place for two days and then you watch that site for about three or four days, making sure that an eczematous dermatitis didn't, didn't develop. Again, this is uncommon, but it's, I see it often enough that uh, I certainly do use tests. I probably have a family do a use test once a week and probably once a month, get someone who uh, actually did develop a medicament contact dermatitis. So anyway, that, that is the one concern when you start to give adequate amounts. So. so with all the side effects that come from the topical steroids, including these, the tachyphylaxis and, and decreased sensitization, this, this contact dermatitis from the group A, the, the skin necrosis and skin thinning that people are, are worried about, why not just put everyone on a topical calcineurin inhibitor? Um, is there a rationale? Yeah, it's just not very potent. Uh, it's potent, but it's often not potent enough. Um, and we don't see too much skin necrosis. You mentioned skin necrosis. Fair so enough, I don't fair wanna, enough. Uh, All actually, right, no, yeah, uh, I appreciate it. No, and it's fine. And again, uh, bias aside, just as a physician, there are a fair number of patients who will, on their own, doing their own research about eczema, uh, become very steroid phobic. And that may be a reasoned approach. And there may be a small portion of babies who truly do develop um, intolerance to all topical steroids. Uh, and so I, I don't want to say that, that uh, you know, uh, unusual conditions can occur, you know, kind of three standard deviation things that can come out. But basically, it's a, you know, it's a potency issue. So and, you know, if we if we are almost at the end, I think it is just important to also bring up that we do have some bigger guns for our uh, real severe uh, kiddos with eczema, including infants. And so there's a variety of very, uh, you know, far more aggressive options. And, you know, you've got this adorable little infant or this little toddler 
uh, with eczema and, and you say, well, gosh, aggressive, you're talking what? Like cyclosporin, you know, dupilumab, which is a biologic, uh, azathioprine, phototherapy. Uh, but the thing is, the actual quality of life for atopic dermatitis uh, can be absolutely miserable. Kiddos can uh, be have severe pruritus. And, and again, when we think about people who can advocate for themselves as adults with itching, itching is one of the chief like emergency room complaints. People get to their wits end. And, and we have uh, adult oncology medications that are FDA approved for just itching associated with side effects of chemo. So we have a, you know, a medicine, a, a prepotent, which is just for myelodysplastic syndrome itching. Uh, and so for adults who can say, hey, I don't like being itching, uh, we, we have a lot of options and it's respected as a, as a, as a symptom. But for our little infants and, and toddlers, again, that, that quality of life and what it means for their sleep and what it means for the, a given family, it is uh, absolutely a debilitating uh, symptom. And so we feel, we feel pretty good about uh, aggressive treatment for severe kiddos with eczema. Um, that's not to say mild, moderate kiddos need to you know, come see a dermatologist to talk about you know, these bigger guns. But, but I think that uh, for very severe, widespread lichenified eczema, we, we can do so much more in 2021 than we could 20 years ago when I graduated from med school that giving us a chance is a, is a good idea. As with so many of the things we talked about uh, on this episode, so many things are case by case. And so we can use narrowband phototherapy, which is a certain wavelength of UV light in the UVB band. Um, it's kind of classically a treatment for psoriasis or for cutaneous lymphomas that are restricted to the skin. Uh, but for some patients, it works really well for eczema. So it could take a while to work. It really takes a lot of effort on the families to bring their babies and kiddos in for, you know, two or three times a week treatment for months on end. But actually, if those families weren't sleeping at night because the kid was up at night scratching or having ER visits for super infected eczema, then two or three times a week trips to my clinic to meet my nice staff uh, and go in our bat cave for phototherapy is, is a good option. Uh, for actual medications, Again, we use, you know, steroid sparing medications, including methotrexate, uh, azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, and cyclosporin. Of those, cyclosporin is probably the best option. Uh, and again, no conflict of interest. These are all decade-old generic medications. But cyclosporin has a much faster onset of activity. And for kiddos with extra, with, with exceptionally excellent uh, renal function, it's a, it's a great, uh, great choice. A joke I often say to my residents is that if, if in 1950 someone realized, uh, you know, had not realized that you could give super therapeutic amounts of prednisone and that it would have anti-inflammatory properties, then I suspect a few years later when cyclosporin was invented, it would have become what we use prednisone for, meaning kind of the best guess, uh, let's give them steroids. And, and so rather than people having steroid psychosis rather than people having osteoporosis, uh, all the various chronic, uh, you know, gastritis, all the various chronic steroid issues, we would instead have people showing up with, you know, renal insufficiency because they had gotten too many courses of cyclosporin at urgent care in the ER. Uh, so the point of, of that little rant, though, is just to say that for kiddos who uh, have, uh, who don't have the com comorbidities, especially the renal comorbidities of adults, cyclosporin is often an excellent option um, with, uh, obviously it requires monitoring, but the monitoring doesn't need to usually be nearly as aggressive as it is for adults. And actually a few, a few separate blood draws is often all we need. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, biologics have really revolutionized uh, atopic dermatitis, which actually gets back to making sure it actually is atopic dermatitis uh, when you're seeing an eczematous eruption. So so, for instance, contact dermatitis, um, this medicine, dupilumab, that again, no conflicts of interest. It's a biologic that blocks IL-4 and 13. And uh, these uh, are the kind of TH2 gatekeeping cytokines. And so it is a focused, you know, kind of in the classic sense, biologic treatment uh, that really blocks uh, the exaggerated immune response uh, that leads to the downstream effects of eczema. It's especially a good option for kiddos who have comorbid asthma, and oftentimes we fix two in one, and then we often fix two incredibly severe conditions uh, in one patient. But we're talking about now giving a shot every other week 
to a kiddo and uh, it's FDA approved. And actually that FDA approval has been marching down. It was 18 and then 12 and then six. So it continues to, to march down. Uh, but even even 12 ain't a lot of fun to, to start an every other week injection. And in fact, it's just infrequent enough that they forget how bad it is. So as opposed to a kiddo who's getting, you know, growth hormone every day or insulin every a couple times a day, probably a pump more often than, than not. But back in my day, uh, you know, a couple times a day for dupilumab, it ends up being, you know, every two weeks and, and it ends up being pretty tough on these families. But it is a great med for when it works, uh, risks of conjunctivitis. And actually, it doesn't work for other mimickers of eczema, including contact dermatitis, or it doesn't work well. And we also see some kiddos who have such severe eczema that we have to add something like cyclosporin to dupilumab. But uh, again, it's it's definitely a big difference from when I uh, graduated med school and we had prednisone, maybe methotrexate, occasionally cyclosporin, but we have so many more great tools available. So Those we probably won't be doing without a derma referral, <laughs> I imagine, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, again, you, you clean up or, you know, you try to fix what you break. Uh, and so <laughs> when, I, when I was a pediatrician, I, I didn't use too many of those either. Fair um, enough. But uh, but that's OK. Like I said, the, the eczema kiddos that I had, I think I still took good care of. And I, and I think many of our pediatrician colleagues listening uh, can do a great job as well. So. Excellent. Craig, thank you so much sure. for uh, spending uh, the time with us this this evening. I think people are really, really going to get a lot from this and learn and hopefully change change their practice. Um, so before we let you go, um, you know, we have just a couple of hand, handful of questions. Um, one of the last ones is, what are your main take home points for our listeners today? If if they were to step away from listening to our episodes, what what do you hope that they'll remember? Sure. So atopic dermatitis is a relatively common disorder with a lot of features that really can uh, uh, be tough on kids and families. And so recognizing it, treating it, and uh, to, to the severity is, is real important. You, you really do a lot. You do a great service for families uh, when you uh, treat it on your own or refer them on. Uh, it's important to uh, consider mimickers. Uh, it's not uncommon that other uh, conditions can have eczematous features and uh, you either could have fixed those a lot more easily, so something like seborrheic dermatitis uh, or contact dermatitis, where you just eliminate a trigger. And, uh, you know, again, uh, I, I think uh, it really is true that our pediatricians, call, uh, allergists, and dermatologists all can take a, a great care of these kiddos. Uh, but if someone's a little more challenging than, than you're comfortable with or not responding to the treatments that worked for the last 10 kids, uh, then, uh, you know, feel free to, I think feeling, feeling free to refer them on is great. But at the same time, if, if you're comfortable with this, I think it's, it's something that, uh, again, it's, it's, uh, it's not the easiest thing to treat, but it's very fulfilling, uh, when these families uh, do well. Awesome. Great. Thank you. And for our listeners, are there anything that you'd like to plug anything that, uh, any resources or cool things that our, re uh, our listeners should check out? Hmm. That's a good question. I probably should have thought of that a little more. You know, the, the National Eczema Association's website is pretty good. Unfortunately, they they do kind of have sponsors, and that sponsorship probably makes its way uh, a little bit better, uh, a little bit more, obviously, than, than we'd like. Um, there are uh, features from a lot of our uh, children's hospitals. Uh, National Jewish Hospital has excellent wet wrap resources in particular. Uh, and then, yeah, in terms of resources, I will tell you that eczema for families is probably a little bit harder google search it's probably a little bit harder meaning meaning there's a lot of uh, complementary alternative treatments uh, that are you know kind of marketed to families and, and again i say this you know teaching at a public uh, medical school not trying to sell something to these families and just trying to fix up kids but uh, there are plenty of um, you know kind of swampy internet resources and forums and a uh, fair number of, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if the internet world of eczema polices itself, as well as a lot of other conditions. And so that's okay. But sometimes guiding that Google search can be uh, a, a more important for this condition than others, especially since one of the one of the key aspects of eczema that I talked about tonight was how, you know, it can uh, vary by patient and, and it's not really a one size fits all. So something that works spectacularly well for one family may not work as well uh, for someone else, which leads to frustration, which leads to, again, um, kind of a foray into uh, kind of an internet world that may not be as well pleased as we'd like. 
This awesome. was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good. I really appreciate all your insights. Yeah. yeah. This you was know, amazing. If, if you guys ever have uh, something, you know, uh, you know, next year, eczema update or if questions come in and I uh, want to go through some question and answer, we could do that. Um, ha- happy to help. I was happy to be on this uh, podcast. Like I said, all, all of my uh, colleagues and prior residents who've been on uh, curbsiders and cribsiders, uh, including some of the founders and so forth. It's it's uh, cool to actually uh, be a be a guest once. So well, really appreciate welcome to the family. So, yeah. <laughs> this has been another episode of the Cribsiders. It's for the kids. Get show notes and sign up for our weekly Knowledge Food Formula Feed newsletter on our website at www.thecribsiders.com. We're committed to providing you with high-value practice changing knowledge, and to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us get new listeners, get you know that prestige, get people listening and, and changing their practice. Um, it also just makes Chris feel really good about himself. Mm-hmm. Um, also, shoot an email, cribsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to our wonderful producer, Dr. Cleo Rochat, for this episode and our wonderful social media and executive team. I've been Dr. Justin Lee Burke. I've been Cleo Rochat. And I'm just thinking it's amazing that you can get allergy to a topical steroid. It just still blows me away. But this has been Chris the Chi Man Chu. Thank you. Good night. Hey, you've already listened to the entire episode. Now claim CME credit. Continuing education credit is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. VCU is accredited to provide continuing education to the entire healthcare team. Check it out at cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information and to claim your credit after listening to this episode.